Hi guys, welcome back. Thanks for staying with us. Uh, thank you for Philippa for introducing the show. We've got a lovely question today from Intabi Singh. Let's have a look at what she has to say. What are you doing? I'm trying to prove that TP is equal to A and X, open bracket, cos Y plus square root of 3, sun Y, close bracket. Hmm. I'm struggling tenfold. Please help me. Thanks for that fabulous question, Tabi Singh. Let's have a look at what it has to say. It says here, TP is a tower. So guys, now why is that important? Well, if they have mention of a tower in a question, we know that it will be a vertical line and the plane will then form a 90 degree angle. It says that it's foot P and the points Q and R are on the same horizontal plane. From Q, the angle of elevation to the top of the building is X. And it is further given that angle PQR is 150 degrees. QPR is Y and the distance between P and R is alpha. Okay, so that's strange. Alpha is usually um, given as an angle, but in this case it's a side. It doesn't make a difference. So we can say then prove that TP is alpha multiplied by tan X uh, multiplied by cos Y plus root 3 sine of Y. So this is the diagram that accompanies the question. And guys, it's really important now to have a look at what this question says. In this diagram, it looks like the whole question is flat, but that's not what the question has said. So it says over here that triangle QPR, so this triangle over here, QPR, is on a different plane from triangle TPQ. Now that's important to note because that means that you can't use TPR as a whole triangle. So let's get on with the proof. It says here, prove that TP is equal to this. Well, TP is found in triangle TPQ. And we want to try and find this length over here with respect to all the other variables which has been given to us. So when I first looked at this question, it was really challenging for me. I didn't know where to begin, um, but I eventually started somewhere where there was some information for me. So in the triangle, I said, well, we're looking for TP, so let's start with the triangle that has TP in it. So we can say then that in this triangle TPQ, uh, we have a right angle. So that means we can use one of our three ratios to try and find what TP is with respect to X and another side. So I can say then that tan of X is going to be equal to my opposite side, which is going to be TP divided by my side PQ. Now, I don't know what PQ is, but I do have information in my other triangle that I'm going to be working with. So let's have a look at what this has to say. We've got PQ over here. We've got to try and find this, that we can substitute that length in for PQ. So if we look at this triangle, we've got 150 degrees opposite the side which we've been given. And the side that we want PQ is opposite angle R. Now we don't know what R is, but we can work it out because we have another two angles which has been given to us. So we can say that R is going to be equal to 180 degrees minus 150 degrees and then minus Y, because that's just using sum of angles in a triangle. And that angle then becomes 30 degrees minus Y. So now we can simply apply our sine rule because we have a side opposite an angle and another side opposite an angle. So if we substitute this into our sine rule, we're going to say then that sine of 150 degrees divided by the opposite side, which is going to be given to as, us as alpha. We then have PQ. Sorry, we can't do that. I'm going to tell you why. Um, when we first apply the sine rule, we use the angle on top first. So we're going to have to use the other angle. So it's going to be sine of 30 degrees minus y. And divided by the side that we're looking for, which is PQ. So guys, remember, if you're using your sine ratio, 
you want to keep your sides um, in the same, or the numerator, the denominator, as, as well as your angles, they must be in the numerator, denominator. That must be consistent between the two ratios that you use when you use your sine rule. So let's carry on with this. Let's simplify. We've got PQ is going to be equal to sine of 100, or sine of 50 degrees rather, minus Y. And that's going to be multiplied by my side alpha. And I'm going to divide this by sine of 150 degrees. Okay, good. So now we're getting somewhere. We have a problem over here. We, we want to try and get cos y into this proof somehow. So we're going to have a look at how we can do that. If we just expand our sine double angle identity over here using our sine double angle, we're going to get sine of 30 degrees multiplied by our cos of y. And we're going to keep the same sign because it's going to be my sine double angle. That's going to be negative cos of 30 degrees multiplied by sine of y. And this is all going to be divided by sine of 150 degrees. And my numerator is multiplied by alpha. So I'm going to simplify this a little bit over here. That's going to be equal to alpha multiplied by all of that divided by sine 150 degrees. So let's carry on with the simplification. Um, I'm going to leave the top as is for now. And I'm going to change my sine of 150 degrees into a reduction angle. So it's going to become sine of 30 degrees times cos of y minus cos of 30 degrees multiplied by sine of y. Now guys, sine of 150 degrees, I'm just going to make a segment of here, yeah, sine of 150 degrees is going to be equal to the same as sine of 180 degrees minus 30 degrees. And using our reduction formula, we can simply say that that there is sine of 30 degrees. So I can substitute that back into what I have at the moment. Hey guys, so we're almost there. Now a whole bunch of simplification is going to be done with, and we're lucky because we've been given that sine of 30 degrees. That 30 degrees is a special angle. So we can simply just substitute in what we know is for, or what we know sine 30 degrees is for our special angle. So we're going to have alpha multiplied by a half times cos of y. Minus cos of 30 degrees is going to give me root 3 over 2 multiplied by sine of y. And this is all going to be divided by sine of 30, which is a half. Okay, guys, so now if we factorize the top over here, we can take out a half. So we're going to have alpha multiplied by a half multiplied by cos of y minus root 3 sine of y, and that's all divided by a half. Okay, so our halves will cancel nicely, and we're left with alpha multiplied by cos of y minus root 3 times sine of y. Okay, so now this is what we found PQ to be, but that's not what we were looking for. Remember, we wanted to find what TP is. So if we have TP over here, we're going to have that TP is equal to, we're just going to do some manipulation over here, that's going to be equal to PQ multiplied by tan of X. And we've just found what PQ is. So substituting that in, we're going to have TP is equal to tan of X multiplied by PQ, which is going to get me tan of X multiplied by what we've just found to be PQ. That's going to get me alpha multiplied by cos of Y minus root 3 times sine of Y. Okay, so I don't think that is exactly what we're looking for. We're looking for alpha times tan X, but that's just rearranging the order of our terms. So we're going to have then 
that Tp is equal to alpha multiplied by tan of x multiplied by cos of y minus root 3 times sine of y. Okay, and that's exactly what we've been looking for. So that is a really great question, guys. Thanks for that. Um, there's a whole bunch of other things that you need to learn from trig. We've got a whole bunch of compound and double angles coming in. We've got our ratios. We've got a whole bunch of special angles. And that was a really great question. Thanks for that, Intabi Singh. Since ancient times, mankind turned their heads skyward and found meaning in observed cosmic events. Interested in the position of heavenly bodies and the movement of the galaxy, one of the first sciences, astronomy, was developed. Mathematics was the fundamental tool that made exploring planetary motion and astronomical interpretation a reality. And some of the greatest breakthroughs in mathematics were made during the study of the stars. The origins of trigonometry can be traced back to the study of astronomy. The two main branches of trigonometry are plane trigonometry and spherical trigonometry. Plane trigonometry studies the relationship between the sides and angles of a triangle where the vertices are located on a flat plane. This is the type of trigonometry you're introduced to at school. Spherical trigonometry deals with curved triangles drawn on the surface of a sphere. This branch of trigonometry, which is used extensively in astronomy and navigation, enables astronomers to project the spherical heavens onto a flat surface for mapping. The positioning of heavenly bodies has always been at the core of astronomy. How do astronomers measure these heavenly distances which lie beyond the reach of measuring instruments? One of the most accurate methods used is called parallax. To understand what parallax is, try this. Place the index finger of your hand in front of your nose. It doesn't matter which hand. First, close your left eye and look at your finger with your right eye. Then close the right eye and look at your finger with your left eye open. What do you notice? Your finger appears to change position compared to the objects in the background. This effect is called parallax. Parallax describes the apparent change in position of an object against a fixed background due to the angle which the object is viewed from. In astronomy, this effect is called trigonometric parallax. The apparent movement of your finger in front of your face has a simple explanation. Your eyes are in different positions on either side of your face, hence they have different lines of sight to your finger. The difference in the angles due to the line of sight is the parallax, and the distance between your eyes is the baseline. The size of the parallax angle is proportional to the length of the baseline. By using parallax, the distance of the baseline, and trigonometry, astronomers can measure the distances to some stars and other objects in our galaxy without leaving the solar system. Stars are astronomically far away from the Earth. As the distance to a star increases, the parallax decreases. Astronomers know that if the parallax angle is too small to measure because the object is too far away, they have to increase the distance between the vantage points of the baseline. Since a star is so far away, its parallax is so small that using a short baseline like the distance from one eye to another will never work. We need a massive baseline to measure from. We have just that in the diameter of the orbit of the Earth. The distance from the Earth to the Sun, the closest star to Earth, is one astronomical unit, or AU, which is roughly 150 million kilometers. Hence, the diameter of the orbit of the Earth is 2 AU, or approximately 300 million kilometers. This is the baseline used to measure the distance to a star.
The method of trigonometric parallaxes used to calculate the distance to nearby stars involves observing how the position of a nearby star seems to change as the Earth is in different positions in its orbit around the Sun. The line of sight to an observed star in December is different from the line of sight in June, when the Earth is on the other side of its orbit. The positions of the observed star, Earth and the Sun, make up the vertices of a triangle. Using trigonometry, the triangle is solved to determine the distance to the star. The angular shift, parallax, is one angle of a triangle, and the distance between the two vantage points, the baseline, is one side of the triangle. Since we have the length of the baseline, 2AU, and can measure the parallax of the star, we can calculate the distance to the star. The majority of stars appear to maintain the same relative position for long periods. In fact, constellations identified by our ancestors are still seen today. So, the observed star that we wish to know the distance to will not change its position significantly in the six months it is under observation. The closest star to our solar system is called Proxima Centauri, and it's about 4.25 light years or 40.2 trillion kilometers away. The Scottish astronomer Robert Innes, who at that time was the director of the Union Observatory in Johannesburg, South Africa, discovered it in 1915. Whilst interstellar travel at this stage may seem like science fiction, one thing is certain. If travelling to the stars were to someday become science fact, mathematics would be fundamental in achieving that reality.